This business guy was finally on the verge of getting promoted, but when he passed through the wrong place at the wrong time, all of his dreams came crashing down, literally. But upon being reborn in a magical world, this guy will try to make a living and succeed before kicking the bucket, so that the same thing that happened in his past life doesn't occur. The story begins with the protagonist walking down the street in a suit, talking on the phone. He's informing his boss that he managed to schedule a meeting with a client, and is heading to the meeting place right now. Unfortunately, the negotiation didn't go very well, but the man doesn't want to give up because this isn't the only client. So he focuses on achieving his goal until he finally meets the company's targets and feels like he's going to get a promotion. Unfortunately, life is unpredictable. It's at this moment that we see a robber fleeing from a store he just robbed. The guard is slightly injured but still manages to chase the criminal and bring him down. In the confusion, the robber ends up firing and guess who was passing by at that moment? Well, it's the protagonist who gets hit in the chest and falls to the ground. People around panic. And while some of them are on their way out of this world, the guy can only think about the promotion he was going to get at work. Suddenly, a light is shown, and a new person appears, while a voice says that this poor soul is destined for a realm similar to this planet, but with magic and monsters, and it's where the protagonist will reincarnate. Suddenly, in a plain field, he awakens as a boy with white hair and blue eyes, who is startled by a dragon flying by out of nowhere. The guy gets up and questions if that's really a dragon. He also remembers what the voice said about reincarnation, but is confused and realizes that the suit he was wearing has disappeared. The voice from earlier speaks to him, saying it will grant basic knowledge of this world, and explains that the guy can say the phrase, open status to see his stats. The guy repeats the phrase, and a digital menu appears in the air. The voice explains that the race and age are already predetermined, but he can choose everything else. Finally, the voice wishes him a blessed life. He then concludes that he has indeed reincarnated. After finishing selecting the options, the chosen name is Lucio. The chosen skills are proficiency analysis, martial arts, magic control, and monster luck, which is probably what was lacking in his previous life. As a profession, Lucio chooses healer. Despite being a supportive role that doesn't stand out much, he can help people and secure a stable job because after all, the guy doesn't have the courage to face monsters. His savings for now are only three silver coins, and despite being only 15 years old in this world, he is already considered an adult, so he has to find a job right away. No handouts for the weak. While walking, the guy stumbles upon the carcass of a monster. He gets scared and runs off, determined to live until old age in this world, unlike his previous life. After a while, Lucial arrives at the entrance of a city and sees people showing documents and paying some coins to the guards. He immediately concludes that he needs to show identification and pay a toll to enter. As he approaches, the guard immediately asks for identification. The guy thinks for a moment and makes up a story to explain the lack of documents. He says he was raised in a remote village and became a healer when he became an adult, but he was expelled because the village had no use for that profession. All of this is said in a convincing manner, as he needed to have his smooth tongue from his previous life as a businessman. Finally, Lucio says he is looking for a clinic to train his skills. The guard asks for a moment and steps away. Then, a very beautiful woman appears to talk to the guy. Her name is Lumina, and she offers to take him to the Healer's Guild. The guard explains that he doesn't need to pay the toll because they don't charge fees to healers. When Lucio realizes that Lumina is already ahead, he hurries to catch up with her but accidentally bumps into a big guy who tells him to watch where he's going. Lucio notices that it's a group of adventurers. Lumina informs them that she's taking the guy to the Healer's Guild, and when one of the adventurers asks if he's a healer, Lucio explains that he can't use magic yet, so he's not exactly a healer. With that, the man tells him not to get corrupted, and the boy flashes a business-like smile and promises to uphold the ethics of the job. After the group leaves, Lumina mentions that he didn't need to worry because no one would harm her with him around. Lucio then understands that this girl must be quite strong to be confident around all those guys. While they walk, the guy asks about the guards not charging the toll of the city entrance, so Lumina explains that only the Empire charges fees to healers, but in this city, they receive special treatment because they deal with life and death. Upon hearing this, Lucio thinks it's the result of his monster luck ability. The duo arrives at the Healer's Guild headquarters and enters the building, where Lumina welcomes him herself. At this moment, the guy realizes how enchanting her smile is and is already getting happy about being reincarnated. The receptionist, named Kururu, hands him a form to fill out. At first, Lucio doesn't understand what's written, but a skill translates everything into Japanese. The guy starts filling out the form while Kururu, who calls Lumina mistress, mentions that the guild could have sent a representative to deal with the newcomer, but Lumina explains that it wasn't a problem because she was already near the entrance. Hearing this conversation, the guy deduces that Lumina is an important person. 
When he has trouble filling the hometown section as he has no way of knowing it, Lucio pretends to be clueless and asks if he can fill in that field with the word village because he doesn't even know if the village had a name. The woman believes that he's somewhat ignorant, so she agrees to leave it like that. When Lucio hands in the form, Kururu takes the paper to a room, so the guy takes the opportunity to ask Lumina if the city has a name, still pretending to be clueless. She is impressed by his lack of knowledge but quickly responds that this is the city of Maritoni in the Republic of Sa Shirul, so the guy promises that he will make an effort to learn these things. Then the receptionist returns with a paper card and asks him to channel magic into the object. The guy concentrates and the paper shines. Then the information appears on the form showing that he is a grade G healer named Lucio. Kururu takes the paper back and goes into the room again. When the guy asks Lumino what the other woman is doing, she explains that the card is being registered in the magical network of the Healer's Guild, so he will be able to use the card that will be recognized in any Healer's Guild in the world. A while later, the woman returns with the paper and mentions that she has already confirmed that he is indeed a Healer, with magic control and an affinity for sacred magic. Seeing that everything is settled, Lumina bids him farewell, but the guy still needs help getting a job at a clinic, so he informs her that he doesn't know how to use sacred magic because there were no spell books in the village and he was the first healer there. With that, the woman remembers how ignorant he is, trusts him, and he's relieved that this conversation went well. Lucille asks Kururu if he can do an internship, but Lumina responds that he has three options. The first is the Spartan training, where he would have to study a lot to learn healing spells, reciting them until he runs out of magic, and then starting over when his mana recovers. In the case of the loan, he would enter a school and study for three years, but he would need to repay a platinum coin to the Healer's Guild. Lastly, if he becomes an apprentice, he will perform tasks for about a year while using his free time to study. Faced with these options, he thinks that being an apprentice seems like the easiest path, but he's unsure if he will have free time. The loan reminds him of how complicated it was to repay that kind of thing in his previous life. Too bad there's no student loan program in this world. Finally, the Spartan training would be like cramming for exams at the last minute. Since he's used to working under pressure to meet targets at his previous job, he believes he can handle Spartan training. Moreover, he has the proficiency analysis skill to help him gauge how much experience he needs to improve his skills. So Lucia decides to go for Spartan training. Kururu is impressed that someone would choose this option willingly and thinks that he's truly inexperienced. Anyway, the decision is made, Lucia bids farewell to Luma and promises to repay the favor. She wishes him good luck with that charming smile. Afterward, the guy arrives at the training room a small windowless room with only a bed and a table with a spellbook. Without wasting time, he starts with the basics, determined to finish within the 10-day deadline. From the book, he learns that reciting the spells causes magical power to leave the person's body, and doing this improves their ability. Now it's time for practice. He needs to channel the spell with a clear mental image to improve magic control. So the guy envisions a minor wound, concentrates, and recites the healing spell. A small light emits from his hand, but Lucio doesn't notice it, though he knows he felt something leaving his body, hopefully not gas. Through the status menu, he sees that he's making progress. His affinity with sacred magic is at 5 out of 100. His mana points are at 45 out of 50, meaning he has only spent 5 points and can still use the magic 9 more times. After using all this mana, the guy starts to recover naturally but feels physically terrible, as if he had drunk too much the night before. Upon fully restoring his mana points, Lucio realizes that improving manipulation and control of magic should reduce mana consumption. So he concentrates to sense the inner magic and learn how to manipulate it. The next day, the guy wakes up thinking he's late for work, but then remembers he's reincarnated in another world and gets excited to continue dedicating himself fully to training. And that's exactly what he does, reciting the spells but stopping before he runs out of mana and using the time to practice manipulation while his mana recovers. By repeating this several times, Lucio feels like he's getting the hang of it, and the numbers don't lie, everything is increasing. Seeing the initial results, the guy gets excited to continue his dedication. Suddenly, a guild employee named Monica appears with a meal for him. Lucio is also enchanted by this girl. Three days later, he manages to cast the spell in a way that makes his hand glow for a while. Monica confirms that he has learned to use the healing spell and charges one silver coin for the service. Before leaving, the guy asks if he should look for Lumina. Upon discovering that he's the guy who arrived with Lumina, Monica apologizes and returns the silver coin because Lumina had already made arrangements for him to stay in the room for 10 days. He mentions that Lumina must indeed be an authority, so Monica tells him that Lumina is the captain of the female paladin regiment of the church. Seeing that she's an important person, Lucio imagines he's lucky again to have met her. Even though he can train for another 7 days, he decides to promote himself as a healer. Monica had told him that guild members pay some fees, 
so he decides to find the Adventurer's Guild. Suddenly, that guy from before Bazin appears. Lucial is worried, but the people in the group seem to be in a good mood. Then a few new adventurers appear, all injured, and Bazin becomes very concerned. Lucio remembers that Monica talked about how the guild couldn't control healers and clinics currently. In the past, the headquarters would send representatives to deal with issues when healers acted in bad faith by charging too much or causing conflicts. But nowadays, they are much more cunning and corrupt, and the laws can't keep up. Keeping this in mind, Lucio approaches and offers to heal the injured adventurers. Without much choice, the adventurers accept Lucio's healing offer. He starts with a girl and tries to perform the first healing, but with the pressure of the moment, the magic doesn't work. The young man refocuses because he can't afford to waste mana. He tries to visualize an image of the wound or wending and finally manages to perform the magic correctly, healing the first person. After healing almost all the adventurers, there's only one person left for him to save. The problem is that he made some mistakes in the incantation and now he's exhausted from using up most of his mana. He collapses almost unconscious as the other adventurers try to help the last injured person. Even in the last seconds before passing out, Lucia was determined to save that person, but there was nothing that could be done. At night, he reflects in the guild's quarters. The adventurers thanked him for what he did. Even though he couldn't save one person, he saved all the others. Nevertheless, the healer feels uneasy and is determined to level up. To do that, he wants to gain experience at the adventurers' guild and improve his skills to survive in this world. The guild is a somewhat large place with various types of adventurers. The healer goes to the reception and asks to register as an adventurer. Then he notices that the receptionist has rabbit ears. She hands him a form to fill out and a card for channeling magic. After filling out, the receptionist checks the card and sees that he has martial arts abilities, so he's cleared to register as an adventurer. She then explains how contracts work. When adventurers complete requests or missions, they receive rewards, but the guild keeps 10% for operational costs. Lucio asks what happens if he can't complete a mission, and the receptionist explains that there are penalties and other fees making it clear that he'll be in trouble if he can't complete the jobs. He also inquires if the Adventurer's Guild accepts healing requests. The receptionist doesn't quite understand, so he switches back to his business mode just to introduce himself as a healer and asks if he can heal any adventurers injured during training and use the payment for his own training. Basically, he wants to be introduced to someone who can help him train in martial arts, and if someone can do that for him, Lucio believes it would be a good deal in exchange for his healing services. Since this kind of decision is not in the receptionist's hands, she asks for a moment while she goes to get someone. As the woman walks away, Lucio thinks that he's done everything he can, and now he just has to trust his luck. Some time later, the receptionist returns with a big man with white hair. At first, the young man is surprised by the imposing figure, but he remembers that in his previous life, he had a boss who also looked tough, so it's better not to judge by appearances. He introduces himself and says that he wants to train in martial arts and magical recovery skills. The man finds this request strange coming from a healer who doesn't want to keep the money. He also questions why a healer wants to learn to fight. Lucille explains that he knows he would be useless in a real fight. If he goes on a journey, even the weakest monster could kill him. To avoid that, he wants to become strong enough to defend himself. After some thought, the man accepts him as a recovery specialist from the training center. The agreement is that Lucia will earn one silver coin per day and the training fees will be deducted from that payment. He asks when the young man can start and Lucia replies that he can return in six days to begin. The man then asks the receptionist, the girl with rabbit ears, to take care of the preparations. She finally introduces herself as Nanella with a gentle smile. Lucio also introduces himself but notices strange looks from the other adventurers in the area. Only when the instructor clears his throat do they disperse. The man also introduces himself, his name is Broad, and he holds the position of head instructor at the guild. Before leaving, he mentions that he'll be waiting for Lucio there in six days and walks away while laughing. At night, Lucio returns to the healer's quarters. He thinks that everything is going well, but he needs to improve his magical recovery to ensure that the adventurers don't lose faith in him. To do that, the healer needs to use all the energy he has. Suddenly, Monica appears in his room bringing his meal. She places the plate on the table and asks if the young man's meeting went well. Lucio responds positively and says that he already has a place to go after finishing his training. Monica congratulates him and also reveals that he needs to improve his skills a bit more. As Lucio begins to eat, Monica expresses support for his efforts to achieve good results. He takes the opportunity to ask what level of magic affinity he needs to reach. She explains that typically someone who reaches level 5 by the age of 20 is considered a prodigy. Since he's 15 years old, the young man wonders if he can reach one level per year, but suddenly, Monica says that if he reaches level 5, she will go on a date with him. 
This catches him completely off guard, thinking about a romantic encounter, but it becomes a motivation for him to work even harder. A week later, this intense training in sacred magic concludes. On the day he's about to leave, Lucio goes to speak with Kururu, realizing that it's been 10 days already. He thanks her for everything they've done for him, as he has learned enough magic to start as a healer now. Kururu praises him, saying that he's impressive and she knows he already has a job to start immediately. Before Lucio leaves, Kururu advises him to thank Lumina if he happens to find her. As he departs from the Healer's Guild, he thinks of it as a new beginning. Upon arriving at the Adventurer's Guild, Lucio notices the other adventurers staring at him again. He encounters another receptionist and realizes that all the girls in this world are beautiful. When he introduces himself and mentions that he's looking for Bra to train, the girl points him toward the staircase leading to the training center. After descending the stairs, he enters a spacious room but seems to be the first one to arrive. Shortly afterward, Broad appears from the same staircase, wearing a menacing look that makes the young man a bit apprehensive. Broad also mentions that they will have the training room to themselves. Lucio finds it strange to be the only one in training, but he thanks Broad for the opportunity. The man praises the young man for not being intimidated by his menacing look. Lucio then tells Broad not to go easy on him because he needs to gain skills to survive. With that look again, Broad warns him not to even think about running away. The training begins with physical exercises, starting with a run. Broad instructs him not to slack off because he could end up as goblin food. He also mentions that sooner or later he will run out of energy and will need to force himself to keep going. The poor guy continues running at full speed while the instructor explains that for an adventurer, stopping means elimination. Suddenly, the young man starts to deliriously think that he's starting to enjoy this, remembering that he couldn't even move in his previous life. So this situation is practically paradise for him as he's breathing and moving while truly living. This delirium occurs just before he collapses from exhaustion. Some time later, everyone in the guild is startled by a loud scream, which turns out to be Lucio screaming in pain while the instructor helps him stretch. Rod explains that stretching is essential to increase the range of motion and attack reach, as well as to gain flexibility to dodge enemy attacks. After the stretching, Rod starts practical training telling Lucio to try to hit him, no matter how. The young man attempts a kick, but it's so slow that Unai could defend against it in time. The instructor acknowledges that he is at a very low level, which is precisely why he wants to get stronger. When Lucio shows determination, the man urges him to keep trying with everything he has. The poor guy tries various punches and kicks, but the instructor easily defends against everything and even retaliates with a slap. Broad then comments that real combat begins when he's exhausted and first, he must learn to move. He concludes by telling him to visualize a successful attack and not to relax. So the young man stands up more motivated, even though he knows he's an amateur. He did some martial arts and physical education in the other world, but he never got into a real fight. Lucio tries another attack, but still without success, even though he imagines the strike hitting. It's so challenging that he even considers giving up, but he can't waste this new beginning, so he'll keep trying. After this practice, with the young man lying on the ground, the instructor finally recognizes that it's time to stop. Lucio thinks about using magic to heal himself, hitting two birds with one stone, but Broad says that letting the body heal naturally will improve physical recovery skills. He recommends using magic only when severely injured. At this point, the young man asks about other students in the training, so Broad explains that there haven't been any newcomers lately because low-level adventurers don't have money to pay for training and focus on real combat instead. Thinking back to that other team, Lucio understands that it must be tough for them. He also mentions that he's not sure if healing works on himself but prefers to save it for adventurers. Broad then asks him to promise to heal anyone, regardless of their race. Suddenly, a group of adventurers looking for the healer appears, but they're unsure if it's a scam or true. Seeing the injured, Lucio approaches to help. One girl has a wolf bite on her leg, so he doesn't waste time and uses his magic. The girl is impressed that he actually healed her, and Lucio realizes that no one in the city really trusts healers. Then the others also ask for help. After completing the job, he tells Broad that he can only use healing magic eight times in a row and asks if it's enough. The instructor says it's sufficient if he can manage it. Broad also suggests that he use the ability until he's almost out of magic to improve training results. The young man remembers his previous job where he pushed himself to the limit, but he feels that it's best to trust the instructor for now. Now that he's in this routine, Lucille imagines that his combat skills will gradually improve, as will his magical affinity while healing others. He can also meditate in the meantime to increase magical recovery. It all seems very efficient, and with Broad by his side, he thinks it's all thanks to his monster luck. Suddenly, Broad makes a proposal, suggesting that Lucio should live in the guild if he wants to train seriously. The young man doesn't have money, but Broad says it's free and he'll get three meals a day. 
It sounds too good to be true. But it turns out that Broad wants to increase the survival rate of inexperienced adventurers and Lucille will be a great help. Of course, the young man accepts but wants to heal not only adventurers but also anyone seeking help. Broad then says that the world would be better with more healers like him. Lucille thinks it might be an exaggeration but sees it as a genuine new beginning. At this moment, the instructor forbids the young man from leaving during training. At first, Lucille is startled by the possibility of being stuck in this place, but refusing means there won't be another place to train. The guy's counterproposal is to do this for a month, so Broad agrees and says he wants the kid to realize how useful he is in this place. With the agreement in place, Broad says that during this month, he will put the kid in the right conditions. Lucio questions whether the guild master might get upset with this kind of arrangement, but Broad tells him not to worry because he has plenty of authority in this place. The boy becomes very happy since he's gaining martial arts training and even three meals a day, with the possibility of improving other skills during this time. Of course, once again, he imagines it's the effect of some kind of extraordinary luck. I wish I had a skill like that. When it's time to take a shower, poor Lucio suffers from the very cold water. But Broad hands him a bundle of clothes to change into and go to the cafeteria. He doesn't know what to do with the used clothes, but when he sniffs them, he is horrified by the stench. Suddenly, Nanella appears to thank him for his work and for taking care of those injured adventurers. She also reveals that Broad asked her to wash the young man's clothes. Inside, he's very happy, but outwardly, he pretends that he can't allow her to do that. So the rabbit girl gets the wrong impression that he doesn't want mixed blood folks touching his clothes, but Lucio says it's not that. He just doesn't want a pretty girl like her to do it for him. Out of the blue, the girl's ears perk up, and she enthusiastically takes the items to take care of them. The guy thanks her but still intends to repay her for her help. When he arrives at the cafeteria, Lucio is quickly called to sit with Broad, and he notices that this situation seems like a company's happy hour, as if it were a business. Broad's table is practically a banquet with so much food, and the man tells Lucio it's all for him to eat. He can eat at his own pace, but he must finish everything. And when he's done, he should meet the instructor in the basement. Thinking that this is also part of the training, the boy starts eating. Luckily for him, the food is delicious, so he happily eats until he's finished. Later, Broad shows him the room where Lucio will stay, and the young man takes the opportunity to ask if there are more people in need of healing. The man says yes, but mentions that his work begins the next day. So the guy lies down to sleep, intending to wake up refreshed. The problem is, he can't fall asleep so easily. When he asks what time it is, a system clock shows that it's 7.16 in the evening and Lucio knows that no modern man can fall asleep so early. Since he won't be able to sleep, the guy decides to use the time to try to improve his skills. He stretches, practices healing magic, meditates, and then repeats all the steps. The next day, Broad knocks on the door, letting him know it's mealtime. In the cafeteria, he is introduced to a man with animal ears called Gulgar who, for some reason, Lucio mentally compares to a bear. When he asks the man's race, Gulver proudly states that he's a wolf, which disappoints the boy. In addition to the meal prepared for Gulver, Lucio has to drink a weird, foul-smelling beverage that the man says was created by the Sage of Time as good for the body. According to him, the drink increases strength, endurance, muscle reaction time, and other things. The effect lasts for six hours, so Lucio sees it as a game-changing item, but Gulver explains that the problem is the horrendous taste so no one else wants to drink it to get stronger. Judging by the color, the guy is sure it's going to be tough on the stomach. And the smell doesn't help either. But to get stronger, he forces himself to drink it. The taste is truly awful, with a viscous sensation on the tongue and a mix of strong, bitter, spicy, and sour flavors. His conclusion is that this is substance X. All he wants now is to spit it all out, rinse his mouth with pure water, and breathe fresh air, but he's afraid to do that near the bear-like guy. He even struggles to stay focused to avoid passing out. The only solution is to down the whole jar in one go. The poor guy heroically drinks it all in one gulp, impressing both Golgar and Broad. Then his body overflows with energy, and he becomes more agitated than I do after drinking coffee. Golgar then tells him to eat quickly and go to Broad, while noting that Lucille has a lot of determination. After a week of training at the guild, the boy still can't land a hit on the master, who continues to be strict with his training. Lucio thanks him for the teachings, but when he sees the man smiling, he realizes something's about to happen. Broad quickly starts throwing punches to train the boy's defense until he sends him soaring over two meters with a chin hook. As he falls, Lucio realizes he still has a long way to go. As a newbie, all he can do is keep trying to learn. He gets up and forces a fake smile for Broad, asking him to try again. The man finds this forced smile in the midst of so much pain creepy, but the boy knows he'll eventually land a hit. Seeing that he still has energy, the master decides to push him even harder, making Lucio realize he accidentally opened the gates of hell. 
Fortunately, a cat girl interrupts the training seeking free healing. She shows that she was bitten on the back by a rat mix. After analyzing the wound, Lucio says he can close it with his healing magic. But because it's a bite, it might carry some disease, so he advises her to see a doctor. Then he casts the healing magic until the wound is completely closed. The girl cries with emotion while Lucio is approached by another adventurer. He comments on the fact that the boy heals mixed blood folks too, so the young man says that humans or mixed bloods, they're all his patients. Hearing this, the guy realizes that Lucio is a good guy and asks if they can come back if they need help again. The healer confirms and suddenly, the cat girl hugs him, thanking him and saying she'll return if she needs to. After that, the adventurer says it's impressive that he's training with Broad because the man becomes a completely different person during training and adventurers avoid training with him. Later, after Lucille has dinner, Goldmer serves him more of that substance X, leaving the young man desperate. Then, as he walks through the corridors, he notices other people watching him and trying to pretend they're not. Before sleeping, the boy reflects on his routine, training from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., three meals a day and nighttime training in magic control and manipulation. He's already getting used to it, and with his analytical ability, he can see that he's genuinely improving. For Lucio, this is already a fulfilling lifestyle, but he doesn't know why he's being watched. In the morning, he tells Brad and Golgar about the people observing him, and they try to play it off. Seeing that these two are behind it, the boy questions the reason. Rod apologizes and explains that everyone is afraid he might run away. Most of the people training to become adventurers aren't wealthy, so they end up taking risky jobs and paying the price. But even if they get injured and can't afford to support themselves, they still force themselves to take those dangerous requests. With him in the guild, they can heal their wounds and get back to work. Now he realizes that, unknowingly, the fate of these adventurers was in his hands. So he stands up and says that he promised to stay for a month, so he asks them to give him their trust and stop watching him, or else next time he'll drag them to the cafeteria and force them to drink that substance, along with Broad since he's the one in charge. As time flies by, Lucio notices more people starting to talk to him, so he hopes this will help him get used to the adventurers. In his training, he starts practicing archery, but is doing very poorly. For now, he only throws stones because Broad still won't let him use real weapons, but he sees that when the month ends, he still won't have mastered anything. Being realistic, he knows there's still a long way to go before he can fight outside, but he continues with a mentality of persistence and enthusiasm. However, Broad questions all this enthusiasm coming from someone who can't hit anything. In addition to the different training, the quantity of Substance X has increased as have the healing requests. When the last day of the agreement arrives, Broad talks to Lucio, praising the work he did in that month. The young man thanks him for what the master did for him and mentions that he'll return to the healer's guild to look for a job, but still intends to come back when he has money. When he hears that, Broad remembers that the boy was broke when he entered this place. Lucio then explains that he still has to pay a fee to the healer's guild. Out of nowhere, Broad asks what he would do if he already had the money, meaning if the instructor gave him the money to pay the fees for a whole year, for example. Lucio says he would probably like to come back and train with him. This makes Broad smile and hand him a bag of coins as a reward for enduring a month of training and saving the lives of adventurers. The boy accepts it, and the man says there are 12 silver coins in it that he can use to pay the fees. Broad mentions that thanks to Lucio, the mortality rate among adventurers has dropped significantly, so he can consider this money as a bonus. At first, the boy thinks it's too much money, but the master talks about his martial arts still being practically child's play. So Broad suggests that he can continue training if he agrees to pay the fees with that money. The young man agrees, and the other adventurers tell him they expect him to return, showing that they are counting on him. Back at the Healer's Guild, the receptionist sees that the money covers a year's worth of fees but asks if he's sure, because if he gets promoted during that time, he'll have to pay additional fees. However, the boy just wants to get stronger for now to become independent rather than increase his own rank. Bowen then tells him to keep up the good work. When he returns to the Adventurer's Guild, Lucio bumps into Broad, who was waiting for him but pretends he was just passing by. Then the man tells Nanella to renew the boy's Adventurer card, surprising Lucio because he thought she would need his permission for that. However, not wanting to waste time, the master grabs him and says that he doesn't need to worry about the contract anymore. During the meal, Broad brings a book for him, it's a low-level spellbook, both a gift and something to help the guild because he needs the healing and detoxification spells. Broad wishes for him to master both and wants Lucille to study for it. The boy realizes that underneath that tough exterior, the master is a bit soft. He thanks him and promises to keep working hard, but the mood sours because it's time to drink the substance again. It's such a large jug that he needs to hold it with both hands and the taste is so terrible that he gets angry at Broad and wants to get revenge by knocking out the master during this year of training. One day, Broad gives Lucille a break. 
It would be the guy's first day off, but he has nothing to do. Knowing this, Brad advises the young man to help with monster butchering at the butcher shop. So he walks through the guild's corridors until he reaches the butcher shop and finds a guy who looks like Golgar. Inside, the butcher thanks him for coming to help and introduces himself as Galba. He is very kind and soon reveals that he is Golgar's brother. Then they start the work. From a bag, the butcher pulls out a huge boar that clearly couldn't fit inside it, but Galba explains that it's a magical bag, leaving Lucial enchanted, reminding him that this is a fantasy world. Afterwards, Galba grabs a knife to start cutting. Lucio feels uneasy at what he sees, but after it's cut, he finds it much easier to watch. The boy realizes it was done quickly, and Galba explains that he has done this many times. When Lucio asks if all the meat goes to the cafeteria, the butcher explains that some of it goes to other guilds and butcher shops in the city to cover operating costs. Galba also reveals that Lucio is accompanying this task to gain some butchering experience, but also because they receive all kinds of monsters in this place and Broad wants him to be able to see the monster's weak points and learn the best ways to attack. With this, the guy realizes that the master expects him to fight monsters at some point. Galba thinks the instructor believes it will help Lucio's survival when he goes on adventures as a healer. He also mentions that nowadays not many newcomers take their training as seriously as he does, but in reality, Lucio just doesn't want to be eliminated too soon. Gala comments that this applies to any adventurer, however, many try to become heroes and rush into battle. As a result, they are defeated quickly. Thanks to Lucio, the mortality rate of new adventurers has decreased. Usually, those who suffer serious injuries end up learning too late that they are not special, but now they are being saved by the novice healer. Lucio is happy about this, but it's time for the next job in the butcher shop, and the boy is tasked with preparing a horned rabbit. The butcher guides him step by step, but it's still challenging for someone who has never done it before even though the creature is no longer alive, Lucio remains tense throughout the process. At the end of the day, he feels much more grateful for the food he eats. In the cafeteria, Gulver tells him to change since his clothes are stained with blood. While washing the clothes, the boy remembers that he has always eaten meat in his previous life, but this is the reaction when someone has to prepare it for the first time. Suddenly, Nanella appears, asking if he's okay. Despite saying yes, the guy still has the rabbit on his mind, especially when he sees the rabbit girl in front of him. She knows he was working in the butcher shop for the first time, so she imagines it must have been difficult. The girl also knows that he must be more tired than he thinks. She says that sometimes new adventurers get excited about their first battle. Even if they defeat monsters without much trouble when they are alone, mental fatigue sets in. That's why she came to check on him as a way to show gratitude for what he does for the guild. So Lucio also thanks her for what she's doing for him. Later, dinner is served, and it's a stew made from the rabbit that Lucio prepared. He tastes it and ends up liking it very much, but Gulver ruins his mood by offering Substance X. After a while, he gets another day off, and again, he has nothing to do. The biggest problem at the moment is that his magic training is progressing slowly. Like in RPGs, each time he levels up, it becomes even harder to reach the next level. Suddenly, the girls, Manella, Molina, and the receptionist, Murnell, approach him. They want to help him learn some things he doesn't know yet, suspicious. The girls lead him down the hallway, and he's worried that other adventurers might see this. However, the girls genuinely want to help him study. Nanella has brought books about monsters. Murnell has brought books about the laws, religions, and mythologies of each country, while Melina has a book about vegetables, mushrooms, fungi, and other beginner-level medicine books. These are knowledge areas he needs to acquire, so he decides to start with Murnell's books. With that, Murnell and Melina leave, leaving the rest to Nanella, as they just wanted to know what he would choose. Inside, the guy thinks the girls are trying to tease him. Starting a lesson, Nanella explains that they are a Maritoni in the Republic of Sa Shurul. This republic governs the Healer's Guild, and in the holy city of Shurul is the castle that serves as the guild's headquarters. This is also the only place in the world that has abolished slavery. This information shocks the boy who wouldn't be, but at least he's lucky to have ended up here. This is how Lucio began studying on his days off. He became quite busy with training, healing, studying, and other tasks. Before he knew it, half a year had passed. One day, Lucio checks the guild's monthly earnings board with Murnell and Melina, and they see that the White Wolf lineage group is doing very well. The girls chat closely and he ends up asking for a little space, but this becomes a reason for them to tease him even more. Suddenly, Melina notices that Lucio's clothes are getting tight on him, the guy is really gaining muscle. So he goes shopping, accompanied by Nanella. He thanks her for the company, but says he could have gone alone if she had given him directions. However, the girl says it could be dangerous. They enter a store and buy some clothes. The guy thanks her for the help and for paying for everything. But the girl reveals that Broad provided the money. Either way, the boy is happy to have made his first purchases in this world. Out of nowhere, they hear a woman screaming, so Lucio rushes into an alley, where he finds Monica injured on the ground. 
She is taken to the guild, and when she wakes up, Lucille and Manella are watching over her. Since Monica doesn't know what happened, he explains how they found her and how initially, the healing magic didn't work, so he used detoxification magic, which helped her recover. Thus, someone used a poison weapon to try to get rid of her. Manella thinks it might be the work of mercenaries and Monica believes they may have been hired by a healer. She tells him that a friend of hers was treated at a clinic but couldn't afford to pay, so she was sold. Lucille comments on how slavery is prohibited in this place, but there is a loophole because it's allowed in other countries. Since Monica publicly opposed it, she must have been targeted for retaliation. Lucille asks which healer would do such a thing and Monica thinks it was a guy named Badakali, who operates the largest healer clinic in Metaroni. Afraid that Monica might be attacked again, Lucille asks Nanella to let her stay at the Adventurer's Guild until things settle down. She worries that healers and adventurers don't get along very well, but Lucille thinks it will work out, especially since he was accepted from the start. Later, the boy reflects on how life doesn't seem to hold much value in this world, which motivates him to keep working harder, as he has the power to save lives. Monica goes to thank him for what he did and asks how much she owes for the healing, but he's not as exploitative as other healers and asks her to consider it a repayment for her kindness. Lucille also invites her to have dinner with Golgar's food, which surprises and touches Monica. A month later, the man who attacked her is arrested, but no connection between the mercenary and the healer is discovered. Nonetheless, Monica decides to continue working at the Adventurer's Guild. Things remain calm for a while until two months later, when Broad comes to ask for Lucille's help with some severely injured adventurers. They suffered a heavy monster attack. Many people are injured, but Broad takes him to help those in the worst condition, like Bastin and another guy who are poisoned, and a third man who is bleeding profusely from a deep wound. Since there's no way to replace lost blood, Lucille decides to start with a bleeding man. After some spell casting, he manages to heal the adventurer. But when it's time to attend to the other two, he feels dizzy and almost collapses. It turns out that the healer has used up all of his magic. Broad then takes out a magical potion. Where did he get that vial? Conveniently, this potion aids in recovery, so after drinking it, the boy can heal and detoxify the adventurers again. By saving those in the most critical condition, Lucille is exhausted and ends up fainting. He wakes up in his room with Nanella sleeping beside him. Lucio managed to save three members of the White Wolf lineage, but some of the other adventurers did not survive. The guy knows he's not omnipotent, but it's genuinely painful to realize that he couldn't save everyone. To ease this pain, he swears by the adventurers who are gone that you will work even harder. When the year of training ends, he opens the status menu again and sees how much he has improved, enhancing his magic manipulation and magical recovery, as well as developing other abilities like danger detection, resistance to paralysis, resistance to weakening, and more. The status menu list has become quite extensive with this growth. Now he's 16 years old, but he's not sure if all this progress is considered good or bad. We see that the guy's hair has grown a bit longer now. When he talks to Bronn, Lucio reveals that he feels like he hasn't progressed much, but the master says he is getting better. The boy mentions that he still can't predict Bronn's attacks or hit him, but the instructor says they have different levels of experience and attributes. To tease him, the man even comments that if Lucio managed to hit him, he would be bedridden for days just from the shock. Even though it's only been a year, the boy says he trained with all of his strength and thanks the master for the training. Now he's confident that if he encounters a monster, he will be able to escape. Broad thought he would feel confident to face the creatures. Finally, the instructor asks why he doesn't try working at the guild like Monica. However, Lucio wants to earn money and learn new spells. His plan is to learn more to save more lives. The guy wants to join a healing clinic, buy a spell book, and work until he becomes more proficient in magic and makes money with it, all while avoiding bankrupting anyone for a cure. Broad says that's exactly like him, and he comments that it was a great year. After this farewell, Lucio finally leaves the Adventurer's Guild, ready for a new adventure. Now that Lucio has left the Adventurer's Guild, he returns to the Healer's Guild, where he finds Kururu looking half asleep. He greets the girl, but she doesn't seem very excited about his presence. Kururu explains that ever since Lucille took Monica to the Adventurer's Guild, she has been trying to hire someone to replace him, but no one has shown up. Nevertheless, Lucille notices that the place doesn't seem too busy to require more staff. He reassures Kururu that at least Monica is no longer in danger, so Kururu relaxes a bit and helps him renew his healer's card. After a while, the red-haired girl rushes out of the room, asking what happened to Lucille as she shakes him frantically. She questions what kind of risky training he went through and what he has been up to all this time. When Lucio mentions that he was in the Adventurer's Guild, the girl calms down. She asks him to explain in detail, so Lucio quickly recounts the details of the training he underwent over the past year. With this, Kuru asks if he enjoys suffering, but Lucio responds that he just wanted to improve his defense skills to avoid getting hurt. 
He also mentions that completing practical training was the best way to increase his affinity with sacred magic. Hearing this, Kururu suggests he could have practiced in a clinic and been paid for his services. However, Lucio believes that for newcomers, gaining experience and practice are more important, and he differentiates between healing for money and receiving a fee for satisfactory treatment. At this moment, he recalls the attack on Monica, highlighting that the Healer's Guild couldn't keep everything under control. Finally, Lucio explains that his goal for the past year was to learn to defend himself and money can't buy that. Kururu apologizes and agrees with him. Lucio also apologizes for his arrogance but adds that he doesn't enjoy suffering. After this conversation, Kururu mentions that she can promote him to Class C, which would increase his fees, but it would also allow him to buy more advanced spell books from Class F to C. The problem is that all of this cost 90 silver coins. Lucio begins to ponder how he will sustain himself, considering the fees, books, rent, and other expenses. To do this, he will need a job, so he decides to inquire about clinics. Suddenly, Master Broad appears in the guild with a bag of coins, requesting that Lucio be transferred to the Adventurer's Guild for a year. The instructor even intends to pay him a salary and wants him to become a permanent resident of the guild. This proposal seems ideal to Lucio, so he accepts it. Kururu is worried, but he reassures her, explaining that Broad is his martial arts instructor and a trustworthy person. Thus, the attendant authorizes his transfer to the Adventurer's Guild. Back at his home, so to speak, Lucio receives some teasing from the adventurers for returning so quickly. But what's most important now is to try to learn as much magic as he can in a year with the new book he acquired. Soon, Broad appears to call the young man to dinner. They head to the dining hall where everyone prepares a surprise reception to welcome Lucio, who is now officially an employee on probation. The first thing Goldor does is offer him Substance X, saying that the party won't start until the first toast. With that, Lucio gives a brief speech as everyone listens, some holding their breath because of the smell of Substance X. He then drinks it all in one go, impressing everyone in the room, though in reality, he wanted everyone to experience this drink as well. Afterward, he eats alone because he stinks so much that people have moved away. At this point, Bazin arrives with the rest of his group and asks Lucio if he likes men. Bazin arrived at this conclusion because Lucio is always training and has never tried to date any of the girls in the guild. However, Lucio explains that if he did something disrespectful, Broad would put an end to it and Bazin agrees. Furthermore, Lucio was very focused on increasing his chances of survival in the past year so he didn't have time for women. It turns out that in his previous residence, people didn't walk around armed like they do in this place, so he's a bit afraid. He gives the example of when he bumped into Bazin for the first time and almost wet himself. The adventurer then says that he doesn't think anyone will mess with Lucio the way he is now, but he can ask for help if needed. Another adventurer named Sekarath also supports this idea, but now he asks Lucio if he really likes girls because he's planning to take him out for some fun one of these days. After this conversation, Monica appears to talk to Lucio and asks about the Healer's Guild. The young man informs her that Kururu seems to be doing well. He also asks if Monica enjoys staying in the Adventurer's Guild, and she responds affirmatively because she can spend a lot of time with the adventurers and with Lucio, which she finds very enjoyable. She thanks him sincerely because it was only possible because he saved her. At this moment, Lucio almost touches her face, but they quickly change the subject. The adventurers in the background see the scene and become a bit envious. Meanwhile, elsewhere, someone has been financially harmed over the past year due to having a healer in the adventurer's guild. During guild training, a big mustache and bald man arrives to find out who this person is. When he encounters Lucio, he approaches him very rudely. This man is the head of Maritomni's strongest clinic, named Badakali. Upon hearing this, Lucio remembers when Monica was attacked and had mentioned his name as the likely perpetrator behind the attack. The bald man tries to order Lucio to leave the Adventurer's Guild and work in his clinic, but the young man refuses, explaining that he is in this place through an official transfer from the Healer's Guild. This angers the man, but Lucio questions what reason he would have to go to his clinic. Badakali claims that with Lucio in the Guild, the number of patients at his clinic has plummeted. Lucio argues that a clinic is a place that saves lives and asks what kind of patients would go to a place with such a bad reputation. This leaves the man furious, but Lucio is not foolish, and he mentions the fact that Badakali is more experienced as a healer and asks for advice on healing. The man is pleased to be recognized as experienced, so he eagerly responds. Lucio's question is about the spell he uses for patients with fractures or serious illnesses. The man says he uses Cure Superior and charges a price of 30 gold coins. When Lucio asks what happens when they can't pay, the man becomes a bit cornered and only says that he always manages to get the money. Of course, Lucio immediately brings up the idea of selling people to other countries when they can't pay and mentions that minor injuries could be treated with a simple cure spell or an improved cure. 
The man becomes arrogant because he doesn't care if people can't afford to pay, and he always uses high-level magic. He believes that no one has the right to complain after their life has been saved by him. This reveals the man's true character. Lucille continues to press him about providing fairer treatments as healing magic is like a blessing that should be used to help people. Suddenly, the bald man says that Lucille is like him when he was younger but imagines that Lucille has never been attacked while trying to heal someone unsuccessfully due to a lack of magic. Lucille imagines that as an experienced healer, Badakuli may have started as he did and may still have some kindness in his heart. Lucille asks if he has never had allies and if he has never thought about the fact that the people who were sold might have families. The man becomes increasingly irritated, while Lucille recognizes that he must have a lot of power, but if people are still avoiding his clinic, there must be some management issue. Losing patience, Badakuli orders his guards to eliminate the young man, but Broad appears at this moment and intimidates both the bald man and his men. Lucio thanks him for the help, and the instructor mentions that he didn't expect this man to come after him. Some time later, concerned that someone might try something against Lucio on behalf of Badakali, Rod tells him that he will no longer train him as a healer, but as a knight or gladiator. Essentially, Lucio will have a Spartan education with double the training intensity, increased meal sizes, and substance X consumption. The young man is reluctant, but the master is not playing around. The new training begins, and as expected, Lucio suffers a lot, but he doesn't give up, making the adventurers see him as some kind of undead. Now everyone teases him with the nickname Masochistic Zombie, which annoys him, but he only now realizes that more people are training lately. Monica informs him that people are following his example. The next day, Broad checks if Lucio can already use barrier magic and asks him to conjure it. The young man uses the spell, and without warning, the master knocks him to the ground with a force that should have rendered him unconscious, but in this case, it didn't cause much damage. The man explains that this could be considered a surprise attack, and that until now, Lucio hadn't experienced any pain in training. Therefore, the training program changes and Lucio starts using a sword and shield for real combat. Rod comments that in the first year of training, he improved his physical foundation, so now he can begin as an apprentice, which means Broad wants a mentor for Lucio from now on. Another change is that he no longer has permission to check his stats, so that he doesn't become fixated on the numbers. The mentor explains that chasing numbers can make him lose sight of what it takes to become truly strong. He mentions that no matter a person's stats, they can die instantly if they receive a fatal blow, even Broad can be taken down if Lucio were to attack him in a vital spot when his guard is down. Thus, more realistic training begins at this point, including sword and shield combat, martial arts, spear fighting, archery, and of course he doesn't neglect his magical studies and training. Sometime later, a hooded figure delivers a report about Lucio to Badakuli. The man becomes frustrated because Lucio charges only one silver coin for an hour of treatment. And it's this kind of competition that makes him appear greedy, for obvious reasons right. The bald man refuses to give up using his skills to continue getting rich. Suddenly, he gets an idea and starts writing a letter about Lucio charging absorbent fees for treatments and how this harms his business. In the letter, he even suggests that the young man be transferred elsewhere. Badakali instructs the hooded figure to deliver the document to the Healer's Guild. The idea is that even if Lucio realizes that he was transferred because of the bald man, it won't affect his reputation so he can endure it for a year until everything returns to normal. Afterward, the man starts laughing so evilly that he strains his throat. Six months after the conversation Lucio had with Badakuli, you find him having lunch with Master Broad, nearly choking on his food due to eating too quickly. Nevertheless, after dislodging his food, he resumes eating at an absurd speed. At this moment, the cook Goldar comments that the young man has gotten into shape, and the instructor agrees. The cook also mentions that people probably wouldn't even realize Lucio is a healer when he walks the streets, as healers typically don't train for battles. Lucio mentions that it was about time and reveals that he has even overcome his fear of blades after being cut multiple times during training. Broad explains that as long as Lucio continues trying to predict his attacks, he'll end up cutting himself from time to time. At least this has given him the confidence that he can protect his own life. This conversation leaves the cook somewhat astonished, but he also doesn't think he should expect anything less from these two, referring to them as the Demon Master and the Masochistic Zombie Apprentice. Lucio doesn't like being called a Masochistic Zombie, but the nickname has stuck. As for Broad, he doesn't understand why he's called a demon because he considers himself a very kind guy. Regarding this, Golgar and Lucio have their doubts. Suddenly, Nanella appears to deliver a letter to the young man. The cook thinks these two are becoming close, but the young ones deny it, saying there's nothing more to it. Then Broad asks whose letter it is and Lucille sees that it's from the Holy Church of Shurul at the guild headquarters. 
In fact, this is a summons, the letter orders Lucille to transfer to work at the headquarters of the Holy Church, because he achieved a Holy Magic affinity level of 5 at such a young age. It also states that they received a recommendation for his efforts in saving lives, but they are aware of the Adventurer Guild's agreement, so the transfer will only happen in 6 months, when the contract expires. Upon hearing this, Brad understands that it's a move by Badakuli, probably done to prevent healings in the Adventurer Guild. At least there's still half a year before the transfer, so Brad says that in addition to the Spartan training, the young man will continue treating patients who need help without restrictions on the number of people with minor injuries. Lucio accepts the challenge but quickly begins to feel the effects of his mana running low thinking he might actually become a real zombie. As there are still people waiting for healing, Goldberg shows up with Substance X, which conveniently helps a bit with magical recovery. So the poor guy drinks it to keep on healing. Sometime later, the cook notices that Broad is also in great shape and even seems younger. Broad mentions that he was also surprised but that Lucial's training raised his martial arts to level 7. Goldbar comments on Broad's old nickname, the Tornado, and how he already had martial arts and class S speed, so it's impressive that he got even stronger. The cook imagines that if he had waited to retire, he might have reached class SS, but none of that matters now. Then Goldbar changes the subject, talking about Lucial constantly drinking that substance. The truth is, old texts say that it makes the body stronger and facilitates stat improvement, but no one knows if it actually works. However, it's too late to tell the young man to stop. They don't know if it's really helping, but at least Lucille is definitely stronger than when he started. Golgar also mentions how the guy's breath becomes dreadful after drinking that stuff. He recalls that even the girls stay away because of the odor when the poor guy drinks the substance. Suddenly, Galba, Golgar's brother, shows up to bring information about the mission he completed. He negotiated to ensure Lucille's safety during a transfer. Moreover, he confirmed that Badakali is indeed behind all this. Since a lot of money is going to the head of the Healer Guild, the next step is to remove him from the market. Afterward, the men talk about how Lucille is a very good person and a dedicated guy, so they can't ignore someone like him. When Gulliver asks about the young man's performance, Broad says that he could handle Class E soldiers and with some tricks, maybe even some Class C ones. So there's still a lot of room for improvement by the end of the semester. The cook suggests that Galba train the guy as well, saying he might consider it if the boy doesn't change in a few years. The conversation suddenly shifts to Lucille's social life. They talk about how the receptionists like him a lot despite everyone calling him the masochistic zombie. Galba thinks it might be because of the demon master or the bear boss and the atmosphere seems tense between the instructor and the cook. However, they end up shouting polite compliments at each other. Finally, Galba talks about when he asked Lucille about his ideal type of girl, and he couldn't answer, only saying she should be beautiful and sweet. So they agree to give the guy a chance when he eventually gets burned. After that, half a year passes and Lucille now has to be transferred. In a conversation with Broad, the boy reveals that he renewed his membership with the Healer Guild and is now Class A. They also discuss the transfer, which the boy can't refuse to avoid suspicion. Broad advises him to escape if the headquarters turns out to be corrupt. Now that they are together in the training room for the last time, Lucio wants to ask a favor of the master. They go to a cemetery where the young man admits that he saved as many people as he could, but many were lost when he couldn't help, and he knows that things will get worse in his absence, especially due to Badakuli's corruption. Lucio wanted to prevent this, so he asked the master to start training for new adventurers, not just basic training, but also monster meat cutting and medicinal herb identification. In addition, the instructors should be high-ranking guild employees. Lucille suggests this be done once a week, and internally, he remembers how everyone helped him when he arrived in this world and how he had great teachers. When Broad questions the reason for this, the boy says that he became strong because of masters like him and believes that if adventurers become stronger and more knowledgeable, the number of injuries will decrease and clinics will have fewer patients. The master finds it amusing that the boy is a healer and still wants to give headaches to the clinics. Lucille says that this is his adventurer's heart, as all the adventurers he met are wonderful people, so he wants Broad to create a system to help their success. The man then asks if Lucio thinks he has grown with what he learned from him, and the young man says that despite still being a bit clumsy, he feels he has grown mentally. In the end, the boy thanks the master for the training, but the master gives him a mischievous smile and says it's not over yet. Then he asks if it's okay for Monica to stay in this guild, and Lucio replies that for her safety, it's probably the best option, but the decision is hers. With the conversation over, Lucio mentions that he needs to pack and Broad draws the girl's attention, who are hiding and eavesdropping. The man moves on, while the boy stays to thank the girls for what they did for him. Nanella says he's an inspiration and Monica thanks him because thanks to Lucio, she didn't end up at square one. Both offer to help if the boy needs anything. 
Nevertheless, he thanks the girls for everything they did and how they supported him during his two years there, so he promises that one day they will have dinner together again. Deep down, he thinks that in a world where life is so cheap, it's important to create reasons to keep living. The boy also says that he will work hard so that by then he knows exactly what his life goals are. The next day, Lucio sees from his adventurer identification card that he has reached Class E. Then he pretends to throw a punch at Brat and swears that one day he'll return and land a hit on the master. Brat responds that if the boy manages to hit him, he'll do anything Lucio asks. So Lucio says he'll make him drink five tankards of Substance X. At that moment, a man arrives calling Lucio and informing him that his luggage is on the carriage. With that, the young man bids farewell to everyone, thanking them from the bottom of his heart, because his days wouldn't have been so productive without this guild. Brat approaches and, on behalf of everyone in the guild, says that the boy was truly great and thanks to him, many adventurers had their lives saved and many people didn't give up or lose their families because of him. To put an end to the sentimentality, Brad gives the boy a farewell gift, a magical bag that can hold 10 things of any kind and a pouch with money inside. The master says it represents their gratitude. Nanella and Monica also say their goodbyes with smiles, telling him not to forget their promise. Other adventurers tell the zombie-like boy not to forget to come back, and with all this, the young man is very moved and sheds a few tears. He finally leaves, and as he walks down the street, we see his new stats. He's now 17 years old, but he still seems to be level 1, though his hit points and mana points have increased significantly, as well as his magic-related skills and other skills he trained in the guild. When he reaches the city's exit, the guard says that his companions are waiting in the carriage. The boy finds it strange that he referred to them as companions, but he goes to the vehicle to introduce himself. Inside, he finds Bazin and the other adventurers. Before he continues his journey, we see some of the titles in Lucio's stats, including Class E in the Adventurer Guild, but most importantly, Class A in the Healer Guild. When Lucio arrives in the sacred city of Sharul, Bazin asks if he wants to go straight to the church. However, since he's running low on Substance X, Lucio prefers to make a stop at the Adventurer's Guild first. He requests Bazin's company to the guild because he's afraid the adventurers there might pick on him. So Bazin decides to accompany the young man. Upon reaching the guild, Lucio notices that the building is similar to the one in the city of Maritoni. Instead of going to the reception, Bazin directs the boy through a door to the cafeteria, where they meet a waitress named Milty. Bazin mentions that he wants to introduce Lucio to the master, so the girl steps aside to summon him. At this moment, Bazin warns Lucio not to judge a book by its cover, as this waitress is at least as powerful as he is. Next, the master arrives, a short and bearded man. When Lucio introduces himself as a healer, Everyone is surprised, and he recalls it's been a while since he received such a reaction from people. When Bazin mentions that Lucio was in the Adventurer's Guild in Maritoni, the master realizes that he is Brod's apprentice. Finally, he places an order for three barrels of Substance X. Everyone is taken aback by the request and comments on the terrible smell. The master then hands Lucio a tankard to drink, saying he can't sell it to someone who can't drink it. When the people around see Lucio drinking the substance without complaining, they comment that he must indeed be the masochistic healer a legend they thought was just a rumor. After Lucio finishes the drink, the master accepts the order and hands over the three barrels of Substance X. While the young man stashes the barrels in his magical bag, the man asks if it's true that he only charges one silver coin for his services. Lucio then mentions that everyone at the Adventurer's Guild in Maritoni was very kind to him, and that if he's ever without work, he can consider their case. Afterward, he returns to the carriage and arrives at the headquarters of the church, which is truly massive. Lucio thanks his colleagues for bringing him so far, but Bazin says it's a pleasure to protect the person who saved his life, and the other adventurers agree. They bid farewell, and Lucio feels a bit lonely, as if it were his first day at a new office. He also imagines that the spell book he received must be very expensive, so he plans to work hard to repay the favor. Next, Lucio enters the grand entrance hall of the headquarters, where he speaks with the receptionists, explaining that he has been transferred and requesting to speak with a supervisor. One of the women retrieves a purple sphere that starts glowing. Lucio recognizes it as a device for telepathic communication. They complement his knowledge, but he mentions that he saw something similar at the Adventurer's Guild. This information surprises the women because it's rare for a healer to visit the Adventurer's Guild. Soon, the priest named Granhart arrives and invites Lucio to accompany him. Behind the counter, the man opens a magical passage in the wall like an automatic door. They enter, stepping on a magical circle that after Granhart activates a magical panel, starts ascending like an elevator. The priest explains that this is a magically elevated platform that can be activated through magic for ascending or descending, and it's the only entrance designed this way to prevent anyone from entering the place. 
Lucial is insured to keep people out or inside. They soon reach the upper floor where Lucial encounters Lumina who recognizes him right away. He didn't expect to meet her so soon, but he thinks it's another stroke of monster luck. Even though she recognizes him, she gets his name wrong and calls him Louis. Lucille corrects her name and takes the opportunity to thank her for what she did for him in the other city. Nevertheless, he's surprised that she recognized him, but Lumina says she remembers how his aura was crystal clear. Lucille suspects this might be some special ability. The paladin wants to talk to him, but since Lucille has just arrived, she asks him to visit her quarters later. Before leaving, Lumina apologizes to Granhart for the interruption, but he says it's not an intrusion since she is the captain of the Valkyria Paladin Regiment. They continue on, passing through a frightening storeroom with some torture equipment. Afterward, they reach a room to have their conversation. Granhart wants to discuss the letter of recommendation, which suggests that Lucille's treatments harm the business of other healers. Therefore, the priest wants to understand the truth behind this. So, Lucille decides to act as he did when he was about to be promoted in his past life's job. He mentions that, in a way, the letter tells the truth but begins to explain the problems he witnessed in Maritoni and how, as a solution, he wanted to make the treatments more transparent so that people could seek treatment without worries. Granhart seems understanding and says he will convey this to the other priests and the archbishop. Now about Lucial's job, according to the letter, he has been assigned to the spiritual cleansing unit of the Church of St. Cherul. He will be a deacon and exorcist. It all sounds very strange. But starting from the next day, he will have to exercise undead, and he will receive a salary of 20 gold coins per month. This amount is indeed quite high and leaves the young man excited, but he is concerned about whether he will be able to handle this job. After that, Lucio goes to Lumina's quarters, and they discuss his transfer. The girl wasn't aware of this news, so Lucio explains how it all happened. Then he also tells her about the new job he just received, and Lumina says it could be dangerous. She mentions that beneath the old headquarters building is a cemetery where the founders rest. Long ago, the place turned into a labyrinth. Upon hearing this, Lucial explains what he knows about these things, how when magic continues to accumulate naturally in an area, it absorbs the desires and resentments of the living, conjuring monsters. Lumina is impressed because she thought he was completely ignorant, but Lucial boasts of having studied a lot in the last two years. Anyway, Lumina mentions that his job is to ensure no undead escape and to reduce their numbers. She also talks about the types of undead and mentions they can be eliminated with sacred purification spells. She also demonstrates knowledge about the combat training Lucille had. One of the advantages of the job is that everything he acquires in the labyrinth is his, and with luck, he might find treasures to sell for exclusive books. Lucille asks if he will become a zombie if bitten, making the joke about being a masochistic zombie, but Lumina says that despite being poisonous, no one becomes a zombie through bites. The blonde also talks about the downside of the job, which is the smell that clings to clothes and can bother people around. But he's used to it because of Substance X. As it's getting late, they bid farewell and Lucio retires to rest, still maintaining his determination as he did in the other city. The next day, Lucio goes to his workplace, where he meets Granhart along with a previous task holder, who introduces himself as Jord. The priest hands over a mantle that the young man will have to wear. This garment can only be worn by those of class A or higher, made of threads of sacred silver that repel the miasma. This mantle is valued at 10 platinum coins, meaning it's very expensive. Additionally, he gives Lucille a card that will allow him to use the elevator platform alone, but before receiving it, he must promise not to bring anyone into the headquarters if he leaves, not even the injured, children, or animals. With the promise made, the card shines brightly, sealing a magical oath. If Lucio breaks the promise, he won't be able to use the card anymore and will face penalties, which he thinks might be related to the torture equipment in the storeroom. After giving these instructions, Granhart instructs Jord to accompany the newcomer. Before entering the labyrinth, Lucio puts on the mantle. They enter the maze and Lucio realizes it really stinks with the smell of rotting flesh, but it still seems better than Substance X. When the first zombie appears, Jord tells Lucio to watch as he demonstrates. By uttering a type of sacred incantation, Jord casts a purification spell that quickly eliminates the monster, dropping a magic stone. Jord explains that since the undead are attracted to the living, the novice only needs to use purification when they approach and then collect the magic stone. Lucial knows that this purification magic is very versatile, dispelling impurities and curses, and even cleaning things like grease from a bowl. After teaching the basics, Jord leaves, fleeing from the smell. To be safer, Lucio picks up a sword from his magical bag, placed there by Broad earlier. After a while of walking, and with no zombies in sight, he decides to map the area to avoid getting lost. The problem is that several zombies appear at once and the young man panics. It's hard to remember the full incantation, which is somewhat lengthy, but eventually he completes it and disposes of the undead. 
He realizes that zombies can be frightening. He then checks his stats to see if defeating the monsters has increased his level, but he's still at level 1. Lucio thinks this undermines the merit of the labyrinth, but he's earning well for this job and continuing in the labyrinth will be good training. Now, remembering that he can't use purification infinitely, Lucio has an idea. He casts purification on his sword and starts using the blade to attack the monsters. This way he consumes fewer mana points while still regaining magic at the same time. Additionally, he's practicing swordsmanship, so it's a two-in-one solution. These monsters don't compare to Broad's level of training, so it's not very challenging for Lucio. Afterward, he tests another technique. By casting the healing magic on an undead, the creature also takes damage. The problem is that his hand becomes dirty, but nothing that purification can't fix. After covering most of the first floor of the labyrinth, Lucio decides to descend to explore the second floor where zombies appear right away. In addition to zombies, there's a Will of the Wisp this time, but it's not much of a challenge either. When he gets hungry, he takes out a sandwich to eat, along with Substance X thanks to this drink, the labyrinth's stench no longer bothers him. And it seems that the undead are no longer trying to attack him. In the end, the second floor is not much more difficult than the first, so in no time, Lucio starts exploring the third floor, where he encounters a horde of skeletons. This time, he has to use purification several times in a row until he runs out of magic. After a rest, he's back on track, and ultimately, the first day of exploration isn't very challenging. When Jordan meets Lucio at the exit of the labyrinth, he playfully uses purification on the newcomer, joking that since Lucio spent half a day in the labyrinth, he thought he might have turned into a zombie. Of course, it's all in good fun. At that moment, Lucio recalls what he did in the den of the undead and realizes that defeating them doesn't change anything. To him, this place is a specialized training center, and the zombies are just illusions. Later, Jord takes Lucio to a shop the headquarters where he can exchange magic stones for points in the store. With these points, he can buy anything inside the shop, which includes a variety of weapons and exclusive spellbooks, as well as potions and magical items. Lucio can't help but think that this all seems like a game. Suddenly, Jord calls over an employee named Catlia. She sympathizes with Lucio about facing the undead, but Lucio mentions that he's developed a resistance to them. Deep down, he can only think of horror movies and games from his previous life. Catlia finds this impressive, and her compliment makes Lucio very happy. However, she quickly becomes serious and asks for the magic stones he collected, making Lucio realize it was just a commercial smile. Using a magical card, she tallies up Lucio's points, total in 4,216. This is a surprising amount for his first day. Lucio contemplates buying a spell book, but the most expensive one costs 1 million points, meaning he would need about 250 days to afford it. Additionally, the weapons in the shop are made of sacred silver, specifically for combating undead, and were forged by dwarves. Lucio is interested in a spear, and Catlia mentions that the price for each weapon is 2,500 points. The price is low because only the curators who work as exorcists buy things from this shop, and since hardly anyone knows how to use weapons, there's no demand for them. Furthermore, the oath also prohibits resale, so there's no market for these weapons. This suits Lucio perfectly, perhaps another effect of monster luck. Lucio still finds it strange that there's no demand, so Cabley explains that you can't cast spells while wielding a weapon. However, Lucio can, and he realizes that this might be why there's no demand for these weapons in the shop. They're considered dead stock, taking up space in the warehouse. Therefore, the newcomer wants to buy a sword and a lance, but since it would cost 5,000 points, he says he'll come back the next day to make the purchase. However, since it's his first purchase, Catlia gives him a discount and lets him have both for 4,000 points. She advises him to be careful and Lucio shows great excitement at the prospect of earning even more points. On his way back, Lucio decides that his next goal is the 1 million point spellbook. Suddenly, he encounters Granhart, who asks how things are going. Lucio says there are no problems so far. The priest mentions that Lucio's salary will be deposited into his guild account at the beginning of the month, and he can check his balance at the reception. Granhart then proceeds to give Lucio various motherly advice such as eating three full meals a day, brushing his teeth well, getting plenty of sleep, and not losing focus to avoid losing his life in the labyrinth. Afterwards, Granhart hands him a habit, a priestly robe, and goes on to talk extensively about the significance of this attire before finally leaving. Lucio is left confused about the kind of person Granhart is. On the next day, Lucio returns to the labyrinth, now equipped with the two weapons he bought. He knows this won't please his mentor, Broad, but he's always wanted to try this. The second day goes smoothly as he explores the labyrinth even further and defeats some monsters that are now armed. Lucio manages to map up to the fifth level and earns over 5,000 points this time, impressing Cablia even more. 
On the third day, Lucial is feeling confident as he explores the sixth floor. He doesn't know how many floors this labyrinth has, but at this pace, he believes he'll cover it quickly. This time, he faces zombie knights and archers, who despite having bows, also approach to attack. The fireballs they shoot are different, but they glow before they attack, so he only needs to hit them before they do. Soon, Lucio steps on a trigger for a trap, and light arrows shoot past him and hit the wall. He thinks this might be a warning about traps that could come ahead and decides to take note of it. Furthermore, from this point onwards, there are many more undead, and because he needs to be more cautious about traps, Lucio's pace slows down. Nevertheless, by continuing to explore carefully, he still manages to collect more points in the store, even though his level remains unchanged. On the 10th day, Lucio reaches the 10th floor, where he faces a large horde of zombies. However, with a single purification spell, he defeats 20 zombies at once. It's an extremely powerful magic. While searching for the staircase to the next floor, he comes across a strange door. Lucio thinks it might be a boss room, so he decides to retreat a bit. Later, he asks Jord about it, who doesn't understand what he means by boss. But when Lucio mentions a room with a stronger monster, Jord confirms that there is such a thing, and that there are many more monsters inside. However, he's surprised that Lucio reached that point so quickly, as Jord had only recently discovered it before assigning the task to Lucio. On the following day, Lucio arrives well prepared. He even bought a bow for this battle, which cost him 50,000 points. Thinking about how long it took Jord to reach this point, he imagines that very few people have completed the labyrinth, which makes sense if it's a training ground for newcomers. He might even end up being the fastest to finish it and hopes for a good reward. Before entering the room, Lucio drinks a potion called Substance X. Upon entering the room, he realizes it's pitch dark, but a luminous creature appears, revealing a large number of undead with other lights appearing as well. Lucio is impressed by the sheer number surrounding him, but manages to stay calm because he wasn't caught off guard. The problem arises when, for some reason, his purification magic doesn't work, and he has to flee. When he's almost cornered, he realizes he should have gathered more information. Suddenly, a zombie attacks from behind, scratching his face. This is when Lucio understands that they are not mere illusions. Without purification magic, Lucio has to rely on his sword to battle the monsters. He can't use spells at the moment, but he can channel magical energy into his weapon. With this, he defeats all the undead. Even though he's exhausted, he believes he could still run if his mentor ordered him to, comparing this experience to the training he received from Broad. As he collects the magic stones, Lucio is caught off guard by a different type of monster. It's a skeleton dressed like a priest, which Lucio recognizes as a wandering spirit. To face this creature, Lucio tries to heal the wounds he received in the last battle, but he still can't use spells. He throws his spear, and the wandering spirit dodges it, seemingly the only monster in the room to keep its distance. So Lucio tries to attack with arrows, but the creature keeps dodging. Lucio realizes that it's afraid of weapons made of sacred silver. Remembering the information that curators can't recite spells while wielding weapons, he thinks it's because magic requires concentration and imagination. So he decides to attack when the wandering spirit is concentrating on casting a spell. Eventually, the opportunity arises and Lucio shoots more arrows, preventing the monster from casting spells. He then seizes the moment to get closer and attack with his sword, but it's still not enough. Anticipating this, Lucio had moved to the other side of the room to retrieve his spear. Now he throws the spear into the creature's chest and finishes it off with a sword strike, finally defeating the boss. With the monster defeated, Lucio can now use healing magic. He realizes that the logic of games applies to this world too, as he can use magic only after defeating the boss. After collecting the magic stones, a door opens, revealing a staircase. However, instead of exploring further, Lucio decides to end the day. When he hands over the magic stones to Catlia, she is surprised by the quantity and the size of one of them. Lucio explains the ordeal he went through on the 10th floor, and Cadlia begins by scolding him for being so reckless. But as he's still a newcomer, she calms down. She exchanges the magic stones, and this time, Lucio receives an additional 100,000 points, probably due to defeating the boss. Next, he shows her the clothing that the wandering spirit was wearing, which he can't evaluate. Upon seeing this, Cadlia instructs him to put on the habit and put the item in a bag before following her. After walking a certain distance, she uses a stone to communicate with someone she addresses as Your Holiness. Lucio thinks that to be in contact with someone with such a title, Catlia must be much more than just a shopkeeper. They enter a room with a red carpet, where Catlia kneels in respect and Lucio follows suit. Behind a curtain is the Pope, an important woman. Catlia explains Lucio's performance and talks about the wandering spirit he faced, as well as the details he provided about having his magic suppressed in the area and the items he brought. The Pope then directs her attention to Lucio, who introduces himself. 
The woman asked him to show what he collected and Lucial hands over the wandering spirit's clothing and staff. The woman recognizes the items as belonging to a priest who disappeared 12 years ago. She also explains the effects of the items. The spiritual necklace reduces magic consumption by half, and the staff of disruption prevents others from using magic nearby. She expresses her interest in buying these items. Lucio glances at Catlia, who gives him a threatening look that clearly indicates he can't refuse. Nevertheless, he decides to make a proposal using his business skills developed in his previous life. Lucio mentions that these items may hold sentimental value for her, so he agrees to give them away, but in exchange he makes a request. Lucio wants a larger magic bag to explore the labyrinth more efficiently. The Pope offers a magical bag that can hold nearly the volume of an entire room, and one can still see what's inside. She finishes by telling him to return with Catlia to see if he finds more while exploring the labyrinth. Afterward, as they head back, Catlia praises how Lucio can stay calm, especially when making a request while offering something to the Pope, an action that few would have the courage to do. Nevertheless, she reassures him that the Pope seems to have taken a liking to him. Despite this, Catlia's threatening gaze prevents him from relaxing completely. One day after conquering the boss room challenge in the labyrinth, Lucio realized he had made many mistakes in that battle and imagined that Master Broad would be disappointed. To make amends, he thought it would be good to join the training of paladins or templars, However, at that moment, his stomach began to rumble, and he went in search of food. On the way, he encountered Lumina and two other members of her regiment. The one with blue hair was named Quina, and the one with red hair was called Lucy. They referred to Lumina as their master, so Lucille introduced himself as an exorcist. The three of them were heading for breakfast as usual after their morning training. Lumina took the opportunity to mention that she had heard about Lucille's good results in just 10 days. Upon hearing this, Lucille revealed that he had something in mind. To have a better conversation, the paladin invited him to have breakfast with them, once again thinking that it was a stroke of incredible luck. Lucio was very happy about it. After he mentioned that he wanted to participate in the paladin's training, the women called him an idiot and thought he wouldn't survive. They spoke to him quite harshly. However, when he showed great sadness at the situation and expressed his desire to return to Maritoni to continue training and become stronger, Quina mentioned that curators could only be transferred when formally appointed by headquarters. At that moment, Lumina said that if it was just about training, she had an idea of how to help, but it might be challenging. Lucille immediately accepted the opportunity, and guess who he thanked for another stroke of luck? Later, upon returning to the labyrinth, Lucille continued exercising from the 11th floor onward, with no major surprises so he took the opportunity to explore the 12th floor as well. He brought back the collected stones to Catlia and unintentionally showed his nervousness. When she asked, he mentioned that she had left a strong impression on him the day before, recalling her sternness and threatening looks. He even asked if she had ever been a paladin or fought under the Pope's command, but again, she displayed that intimidating personality before speaking gently, making it clear that she didn't want to talk about her past. Therefore, Lucio shrank back and dropped the subject. Catlia took the opportunity to give him the magical bag he had requested from the Pope and told him to channel his magic into the bag, a strange conversation. He followed her instructions, and the magical bag glowed and changed color. Catlia then explained that the item now belonged to Lucio, and that he could store almost anything within his reach simply by touching the object and saying store. To retrieve items, he only needed to imagine them and say retrieve. In addition to all the convenience the magical bag offered, Lucio found books inside it, and Catlia mentioned that it was the Pope's idea to include all the books from the shop. As expected, the young man attributed this stroke of luck to the monster luck, making it the third time in the same day. The next day, Lucille explored up to the 15th floor of the labyrinth, and then went to the paladin's training. After introducing himself, Luminous said they would start with warm-up exercises and combat training. Despite knowing that they were likely much stronger than him, Lucille felt uneasy about engaging in combat with the woman. However, Lumina didn't seem to mind. The warm-up exercise was a race, and Lucille thought it would be a breeze after all the running he had done during Broad's training. But he couldn't keep up with the women and Lumina called him slow after they lapped him several times, even though he was running as fast as he could. He didn't want his training with Broad to go to waste and he couldn't accept falling behind due to their level and profession, so he gave it his all. After half an hour of running, the exorcist finished the warm-up eight laps behind the women and felt humiliated by it. Now it was time for combat training. Lumina had the paladins fight each other while watching Lucio, who wielded two weapons. She asked him how long he had been using this fighting style, and he mentioned that he had been doing it since he started exploring the labyrinth. Lumina commented that it was reckless to do so without dual-wielding proficiency. 
With that said, she asked him to fight her using the style he had learned at the Adventurer's Guild. Lucio switched to sword and shield and despite fighting with all his might, couldn't land a single blow on Lumina who even punched him and exposed a vulnerability. He then began chanting a spell while recalling a tip from Broad about most opponents being stronger than him and the need to set a trap. After casting the greater healing spell, he made a precise attack, or so he thought. Lumina appeared behind him and praised his effort but left him unconscious with the next strike. Some time later, Lucy woke him up with slaps on his face. Despite everything, they revealed that Lumina seemed to have gone too hard on him, in a way they weren't used to seeing, perhaps out of respect for the healer. On the following day, they had a bodyguard training session, with Lucio on Quina and Lucy's team. Their team won, and the leader of the opposing team, Elizabeth, blamed their loss on Lucio's presence. Lumina agreed, as with less than five years of experience, it should have been a challenge for Lucy's team, but Lucio had significantly strengthened their defense. Lumina also mentioned that Lucio, at 17 years old, was already a class 5 healer with an affinity for holy magic at level 7, which was completely abnormal. Elizabeth claimed that even for a talented healer, this was impossible, but Lumina repeated that Lucio was an anomaly. Lucio felt that the word anomaly wasn't quite appropriate and thought it was rude. However, Lumina had heard that after leaving the Healer's Guild, Lucio had taken shelter in the Adventurer's Guild, healing people for free in exchange for training and enduring beatings all day long for a long time. Lucio was surprised at how much information had spread, and Lumina even mentioned his nickname, the Masochistic Zombie. With this, the Paladin made him admit that he was indeed not normal, and Lucio apologized for complaining. The next day, he returned to the Labyrinth, pondering the difficulty of improving his skills even after such training. However, as Master Broad had advised, he shouldn't fixate on the numbers and continued exploring up to the 16th floor. There he faced some undead creatures, now equipped with a sword and shield. With a magical bag, it was much easier to equip his weapons for combat. Next, he encountered a trap, and confident in the protection of his magical cloak and barrier spell, he decided to investigate it. This time, the button attracted zombies that surrounded him, but his purification magic and fighting skills were enough to defeat them. Despite feeling pain when attacked, Lucio still considered these undead creatures to be illusions because they didn't level up when he defeated them. Nevertheless, he saw it all as part of his training. In the following days, he reached the 20th floor, where he encountered another boss rune door, which he and Catlia referred to as the main chamber. He asked Catlia what lay beyond the 20th floor, but she had never entered the labyrinth, so she couldn't say for sure. It could be another guild member who had lost their life in the labyrinth. He thought about the sadness in her expression but concluded that it might be an act because he still believed that everything in this labyrinth was an illusion. In the next two days, he returned to the 10th floor boss room. Then on the following day, Elizabeth visited his quarters to invite him to the dual-wielding training but was frustrated by his disheveled appearance just after waking up. First, he watched a duel between two women using swords in both hands. The fight was evenly matched but ended when one surrendered. Lumina asked him what he observed, and he commented on the paladin's performance acting as if they were always thinking several steps ahead. Regarding dual wielding, he admitted that it left the fighter vulnerable, especially during an attack, but with two weapons, one couldn't stop attacking. The next combat pitted Lucio against one of the girls. He used a sword and shield while she used two swords. He cast his barrier magic before the fight. At the start of the duel, he was pressured by her multiple attacks but managed to defend with his shield. When he thought it was time to counterattack, he received a kick to the face and fell to the ground. He healed himself and moved on to the next fight, this time against Elizabeth, but once again, he quickly lost. He asked her if she had disappeared during the fight, and she explained that she had used an illusion skill, thanks to her dual affinity with water and fire. Through this training, he learned a great deal until finally unlocking the doors to the main chamber on the 20th floor. With more experience, he defeated the boss there and brought the items back to the Pope. The items left by the wandering spirit had belonged to a high priest who had entered the labyrinth more than 10 years ago and got lost. Lucio asked if the priest had turned into an undead and turned against the church. Catlia scolded him, but the Pope explained that the man had turned against the Republic, the church headquarters, and the guild. She revealed that it had been 50 years since the church's underground had turned into a labyrinth, and no one knew what had caused the transformation because it used to be a place teeming with life. Lucio found it strange that she knew something from 50 years ago while looking so young. The woman also explained that many had attempted to seal the labyrinth, which prevented the monsters from escaping. She confirmed that there was a way to defeat this labyrinth by destroying the miasma emitter core. Supposedly, this would cause the impurity to dissipate and the labyrinth would disappear over time. However, no one had achieved this feat so far. There had even been a group of elite Templars and Paladins who attempted to explore the labyrinth at an accelerated pace. 
Lucian assumed they must have been as strong as Lumina, so this labyrinth was worse than he had imagined. The issue was that the miasma and foul odor slowed down their progress. Lucio felt he could handle the smell, but the Pope explained that many lives had been lost in this labyrinth, and the healers were being used as exorcists because fewer people were born with the professions of Templar or Paladin. Thus, healers of purification magic were the only option to prevent the zombies from escaping. She emphasized that this was the top priority at the moment, but asked Lucille to continue exploring the labyrinth and inquired if there was anything he needed for the mission. Lucille mentioned weapons and equipment resistant to undead creatures. Finally, the Pope said that when he reached Class 7 as a healer, she could promote him. After this conversation, Lucille was very happy about the prospect of promotion. With Substance X running low, Lucille heads to the Adventurer's Guild to restock. Right from the start, he notices many adventurers giving him odd looks because he's a healer. He finds the master and requests 10 barrels of Substance X, immediately drawing the adventurer's attention for a different reason now. The master takes advantage of the situation and asks Lucille for a favor. He wants Lucille to negotiate in the guild just like he did in Maritoni. Lucille explains that he can't because he's still working at the church headquarters. The man then asks if Lucille would consider becoming an adventurer to fulfill this request. Lucille reflects on his promise in Maritoni to help adventurers in need and agrees since he's an adventurer himself and can assist in this way. While the master goes to get Substance X, Milty explains that some high-level monsters have been appearing and some adventurers have been seriously injured. This saddens the master as adventurers are like family to him. When Lucio suggests taking the injured to a clinic, the wounded becomes agitated because no one can afford treatment and they'd likely be sold as slaves. At this moment, the master returns and Lucio says he will only charge one silver coin per person for treatment. After that, we see the place where the injured adventurers are gathered. There are quite a few people, and no one can afford the cost of treatment at a clinic, so they've lost hope. Suddenly, Lucio arrives with the master, and everyone becomes angry at the presence of a healer. The man restores order and tells them about Lucio being an urban legend in Maritoni, the masochistic zombie healer who helps people for a silver coin. Upon hearing this, the adventurers comment that they thought it was just a legend, and everyone starts calling him by the nickname Zombie Masochist, which Lucille obviously dislikes and doesn't want it to stick. Still willing to help, the boy asks them not to revolt or attack the clinics because they are too expensive. He can only help this time because he went to get the substance, but he sets three conditions for his help. First, the treatment costs one silver coin per person. The second condition is that if anyone from the church, like him, the Pope, or the Valkyries, has problems, they should do their best to help. Finally, he forbids using nicknames with the words zombie or masochist. Everyone agrees to the condition, so he begins the treatment. It doesn't take long because the boy casts an area healing spell, capable of healing everyone at once. Then they start thinking of a new nickname for Lucio. Some suggest names related to the cost of his healing, like Frugal Healer, while another suggests Bloodthirsty Healer, because the young man enjoys fighting. However, everyone still thinks Zombie Masochist suits him better. Gradually, they agree on calling him the Eccentric Saint, but Lucille is sure that adventurers are terrible at giving nicknames. The next day, before entering the labyrinth, Lucille talks to Catlia, who notices he arrived a bit later than usual. He explains that he said goodbye to the Valkyries, but the adventurers formed a crowd for him. This time, Lucille mentions that he wants to spend more time in the labyrinth. Catlia warns him about the danger, but he mentions having enough supplies in his magical bag and that the monsters from the main chamber won't appear again unless the door is opened. She reluctantly agrees but asks him to return at least once a week. She doesn't want him to overdo it and risk his life. Later, he returns before a week has passed, so Cadlia takes the opportunity to give him new weapons, armor, and magical items from the Pope. With this equipment, Lucille is now equipped like a paladin. Besides the gear, she gives him a pillow called the Angel's Pillow which helps with deep sleep and waking up refreshed, I need one of those. Afterward, he goes to the Adventurer's Guild to pick up Substance X. The master was already expecting him, assuming it was the eccentric saint's day off. Along with the purchase, he asks the man to deliver a letter to the Maritoni Guild. He's written to his friends before, but hasn't received any replies. At this moment, other adventurers arrive to greet the eccentric saint and invite him to join a simulated battle after healing. Lucio realizes that the nickname has caught on. The master comments that the number of casualties and mission failures has decreased significantly since the adventurers started training more. Next, an adventurer named Elitz appears to greet the healer, showing a certain closeness, and it seems he recently taught Lucille a physical enhancement skill. Lucille tries to use the skill but still needs practice. Nevertheless, Elitz comments that Lucille has good magical control, but he's stuck at level 1. Lucille admits that he has never defeated any monsters because he still thinks the ones in the labyrinth are just illusions. 
Elitz thinks it's a waste because the healer is good at fighting like a diamond in the rough. Milty arrives and calls him to perform the healings. After helping everyone, he asks if anyone has news from Maritoni or the Valkyrie Regiment. Regarding the Valkyries, an adventurer mentions they are safe, but some Templars have gone missing from the base. About Maritoni, they say that the tornado is out of control, kidnapping adventurers and taking them to the training room. Lucial knows that Tornado is the nickname of Master Broad, and the adventurers mention that he used to focus only on his apprentice. But when the apprentice left, other adventurers had to suffer the consequences. We know this apprentice was Lucio. There's also news about the cook, who's making people consume Substance X and coming up with new recipes. Finally, they mention that the receptionists at the Adventurers Guild are getting married, and rumors suggest they fell for adventurers with Class A mixed bloodlines. Since it's receptionists in plural, Lucial knows there are at least two of them, so he assumes one of them is Nanella since the grooms have mixed bloodlines, and he thinks that might be the reason for not receiving any replies to his letters. Anyway, he hopes they at least invite him to the wedding. A few months later, Lucial completes the main chamber of the 30th floor using his area healing spell to defeat the monsters and gains various items this time. When he returns, Catlia is greatly relieved that he has come back alive. This time, he has earned more than 400,000 points, allowing him to buy a powerful cloak and some magical potions, so he's not solely dependent on his healing magic when injured. When he mentions using the area healing spell to clear the chamber, Catlia is impressed that someone so young can use such magic. She suspects he might have lied about his age, and Lucio reveals that when he first joined the guild at 15, he didn't even know how to use basic healing magic. With this, Catlia asks if he used any suspicious drugs. Lucio remembers Substance X, so Catlia takes him to confess this to the Pope. He hopes to gather information about the substance this way. When they arrive, the Pope expresses surprise that Lucio has reached level 30 of the labyrinth alone. She thanks him for his efforts and acknowledges that his magical abilities have greatly improved. Catlia then reveals that he has been consuming Substance X for the past two and a half years. Lucille shows them a barrel of it, but the smell is unpleasant, so Catlia orders it to be stored. She asks if it's a poison and Lucille says no, but suggests purifying it just to be sure. When Lucille explains that it's a beverage used in the Adventurer's Guild and provides details about the substance, the Pope recognizes it and explains that it was created to awaken people's talents. It's made from medicinal herbs, dragon heart, and spiritual water, all transformed into a pill. They say a sage developed a magical device to replicate this recipe at any time, but it turned out as a liquid. Substance X was the name of the pill, but the liquid version was so unpalatable that it was called the Lament of God. Lucio admits that even God would lament the taste of this drink. Nevertheless, he reveals that he consumes three mugs of it daily after meals and has been doing so for two and a half years. His motivation is that life in this world is fragile, so he felt he had to do everything to survive. However, since there are no side effects, he doesn't see a problem with it. The Pope comments that his growth must have come from his efforts and the trial of drinking this substance. With this, she returns to the labyrinth topic and asks which monsters he encountered this time. Lucio mentions encountering three lost souls and five phantom knights. He managed to avoid their attacks and use his area healing spell to defeat them. Recognizing his talent, the Pope suggests that maybe one day he will become a sage. Analyzing the items he obtained from the monsters, she mentions three girls but doesn't elaborate. She concludes the meeting by saying she will leave the reward with Catlia as soon as possible. Afterward, we see Lucio coming another day to talk to Catlia. She hands him a letter sent by the Pope, detailing the effects of the Lament of God or Substance X. Lucio takes the paper and decides to read it in the labyrinth. Before he leaves, the woman wishes him good luck and says she'll be there for him if he ever encounters difficulties. In the labyrinth, Lucio reads the notes about the Lament of God. The paper contains information written by the sage himself. It starts by mentioning the three primal impulses of humans, sleep, food, and reproduction. However, these impulses tend to decrease in individuals who dedicate themselves to the church. Considering that this medication could help devotees not lose the joys of life, the substance's effect is to amplify these impulses, but it has various side effects. The medication protects the body from diseases and facilitates growth, but criticism due to the unbearable smell caused the church to give up on it. Therefore, the sage decided to pass it on to the Adventurer's Guild, hoping that the Lament of God would one day be the item that saves the world. Regarding how Substance X works, it essentially amplifies one of the primal instincts and converts that energy to increase overall physical capacity, meaning one of the instincts is sacrificed. With this in mind, Lucio begins to think about his case. He realizes that he feels hungry and enjoys sleeping, but never felt the urge for reproduction. This discovery frustrates him, and he believes that Catlia felt sorry for him. He now considers himself essentially a celibate sage. 
He remembers that there are many women in this world, but he has never felt desire around them. Nevertheless, they catch his attention, so he knows he has attraction but lacks the desire. Determined, he decides to conquer the labyrinth to experience love. With newfound determination, he springs into action, more eager than ever before. One month after discovering the secret of Substance X, Lucio continues to explore the labyrinth, reaching level 40. However, he doesn't feel ready to face the boss of this floor just yet. He's got bad feeling about it. So he decides to stop by the Adventurer's Guild to gather more information about the undead. But before he enters, a girl with beastly ears appears. Lucio tries to talk to the mixed blood child, but she doesn't respond. He realizes that if people see him in this situation, they might give him an even worse nickname, so he takes the child inside the guild. What Lucio didn't expect was to be greeted by Nanella and Monica. The problem is, before he can talk to them, the adventurers in the guild waste no time and grab him, announcing to everyone that Weird Sing has arrived to heal everyone in need. With no other option, Lucio uses his magic to help the wounded adventurers. At a certain point, he informs Milty about the mixed blood child who seems to need assistance. She goes over to the girl who is already being looked after by Monica and Nanella. While he continues to heal, Lucia wonders why these two came to the capital and suddenly realizes that they came to announce their wedding. This makes him want to cry. After helping everyone in need, Lucia is called by Milty, who tells him to accompany the mixed blood child to the suburb. It's an urgent mission, but the receptionists from Maritomini want to go with him. Additionally, since it's a somewhat dangerous place, a master offers to go along as well. The suburb community has run down, unmaintained houses. Lucio senses a strange smell, almost like the smell of death, and there are puddles of blood everywhere. In an open area, the group finds several wounded and sick mixed blood individuals. The master explains that they seem to be representatives from the independent city state of Yenis. Nanella explains that as they approached the border, they were attacked by a large group of bandits. With this many people, there's no way to take them all to the clinics. Lucio understands that this is the reason the girl asked for help at the guild. When a man gets up, Lucio approaches to check if he's okay, but the mixed blood man seems somehow unconscious. Suddenly, the man attacks the young man with a knife and then collapses. Lucio immediately recalls his experiences from a previous life and thinks he's in trouble again. However, he regains his determination to survive. He removes the dagger and casts an area healing spell, helping all the mixed blood individuals while simultaneously healing his own wound. The women approach him, concerned, and the master apologizes for the oversight as he didn't think anyone would attack him. The young man isn't resentful towards the mixed blood man, he believes the man was just trying to protect his comrades on instinct. After more purification and regeneration, Lucio determines that the treatment is complete and realizes that the man who attacked him is the father of the girl who asked for help. Other residents of the community appear at this moment and beg for help, behaving very submissively, almost like a Japanese bow. Since Lucio couldn't heal people for free according to the rules, he does it under the pretext of charity. Afterwards, he purifies the area that was the source of the disease and explains that he can't do this all the time, emphasizing the importance of public safety and the need for regular cleaning to prevent injuries or illness. Later, Lucio returns to the capital center and talks to his friends. When Manella expresses concern about him being injured, the guy is delighted and thinks that this might give him the determination he needs to face the boss on level 40. He once again associates the situation with incredible luck. Then he asks why they are in the capital since the guild must be struggling without the receptionists. Monica explains that it will indeed be hard for the guild to manage reception, especially with two receptionists getting married. So they came to visit him before things get even busier. Almost unable to speak, Lucio asks who the two are getting married and Nanella replies that it's Molina and Renell. Monica mentions that they talked about it in their letters, so be surprised because he never received their letters, and he always writes but never gets a response. Upon hearing this, the girls reveal that they also didn't receive any letters from him, but Brad seemed to have received something because he looked very happy. To clear things up, they go to the master, who reveals that he always celebrates after work and forgot to send out all the letters. Before the conversation continues, Elitz appears and asks which of the two girls is Lucio's girlfriend. He feels embarrassed. But the other adventurers also comment that these girls were with him even in the suburb, and some even think he's dating both of them. He then tells Elitz that it was thanks to these friends that he became a healer. With their support, he endured Substance X and Brod's training. When they hear Brod's name, the adventurers are astonished, recognizing that he's talking about Tornado the Master. Afterward, he goes to the two girls, and they explain that they will be staying in the capital for three nights, so he wants to spend as much time with them as possible. So the girls grab him by the arms and take him to the training room, where there are more people to be healed. Wishio finds it strange, but this is how they want to spend time with him. Supporting this work, 
so the three of them spend their time taking care of the injured adventurers. As an apology for the letters, the master throws a big feast for everyone, and shortly after, it's time for the girls to leave. Lucille says an emotional goodbye, thanking them for the visit and promising that he'll try to visit them next time. After their departure, he feels re-energized and ready to continue fighting in the labyrinth. Then the mixed blood people come to him to thank him for all the help and apologize for the stabbing, again performing the submissive Japanese-style greeting. Lucille tells them that what matters is that he was able to save their lives, which moves the man emotionally. They then reveal that they managed to speak with the Pope to open a guild for healers in Yenis and thank Lucille again. Without him, they might not have survived. The man's excessive politeness continues and Lucio finds himself in a competition until the mixed blood girl approaches him with a smile. The father calls her Sheila and explains that she lost her voice after damaging her vocal cords in an accident. Lucio kneels down and tells the child that she's a hero for saving all these people and shouldn't let fate hold her back. He also performs a conjuration unsure if it will work because he hasn't mastered it yet. The magic is called extra healing and Lucio hopes it will help Sheila regain her voice. Afterwards, in a conversation with Lumina, the guy admits that he doesn't feel ready to face the main chamber on level 40. She calls him a coward, but she says it's not a bad thing because he risks his life exploring the labyrinth, so if he feels unsure, she suggests he train more. Since it has been a year since he arrived at the headquarters, Lumina wants to see how much he has improved, so they engage in a training battle. Lucio starts defensively because it's challenging to fight against someone as amazing as Lumina, even with his physical enhancement ability. To make an attack, he tries something unexpected, switching from a sword to a dagger. Lucio almost lands a hit on her, and she admits to being surprised and says he has indeed become stronger. They drink a bit more, and then with the guy exhausted, the paladin again comments on how much he has improved, but advises him not to try fighting against very strong enemies just yet. With this conversation, he notices that Lumina is speaking informally. She admits that she makes an effort to speak formally, but sometimes gets distracted. Lucio tells her that the friendly tone suits her and she says that among paladins it's more common to be serious, but between the two of them, she can be at ease. The next day, Lumina leaves with the other Valkyries for the border and six months later, after extensive training, Lucio tells Catlia that he's finally going to enter the main chamber on level 40. She hands him a letter left by Lumina, explaining the type of enemy he might encounter in this room. A man who used his exceptional spear skills to rise in rank and become the Chief Templar and a knight who used powerful healing magic and sword technique to become the Captain of the Paladins. However, there's only one enemy in the chamber and Lucio understands that the two merge into one undead monster. This monster wields both a sword and a spear, the fighting style Lucio wanted to use. Unfortunately, purification magic has no effect on it, but physical attacks seem to work, although it's hard to gauge the damage. Lucio ends up cornered and with no other options, pulls something out of his magic bag which happens to be barrels of substance X. As absurd as it sounds, the stench drives the monster away, creating a safe zone in the corner. He continues the fight gradually, but it takes so long and so many battles that he even loses an arm. Fortunately, for someone with powerful healing, it's just a minor setback. Lucio ends up sleeping in the area protected by Substance X after a week of daily battles, he realizes he's running out of food and decides to put an end to it. For a moment, he thinks that if he dies, the Pope might resurrect him like in an RPG game. But he dismisses the idea because he knows this labyrinth is real, especially after all the serious injuries he's endured, even though his level hasn't increased for some reason. Realizing that this isn't a game with a reset option, Lucio charges forward, determined to survive, He's fought so much that he's learned the attack patterns and from his experience with this dual-wielding enemy, he manages to force an opening, taking advantage of the enemy's lack of defense. Lucio also recalls what Broad said about it not mattering how strong a person is, if they lose their cool, there's no turning back. Without being sure if this applies to undead creatures, the young man decides to trust the master's advice, visualizing the people he wants to see again as his motivation to survive. With this in mind, Lucio finishes off the enemy with a precise attack. The item left behind by this boss is a book. However, when he tries to go back, the door won't open, no matter how hard he pushes or pulls. He is forced to continue, using Substance X as a monster repellent. Along the way, he finds treasure chests and easily locates the stairs to the next levels. Finally, he reaches level 50 and encounters another main chamber. 